new direction for the iPhone visually. Now let's talk about product definition. For most platforms, the development cycle is comprised of maybe five or six percent being design, and usually that time is spent up front. Whereas with the iPhone, we recommend at least half of your time be devoted to design. Many of you might be thinking, I'm an engineer, right? I'm not a designer. I don't make things look pretty in Photoshop all day. So this half is something I'm either going to relegate to somebody else or I'm just going to skip. But when I'm talking about design, I'm referring to the process of scoping out your application, figuring out your hierarchy, mapping out the flow, figuring out the objects, all the things that most engineers enjoy. So when I say design, I'm not just talking about drawing things or making things look pretty. I'm talking about being intentional. No one manufactures an object that you buy in the real world without taking a lot of time to design it up front. You don't build a house without laying out blueprints. No one builds as they go. And yet, on so many other platforms, that's the way people approach software development. So to illustrate this, today we're going to look at a tried and true example. We're going to take photo, iPhoto on the desktop and show you its conversion to photos on the iPhone. Invariably, every single feature starts out with a long list of nice-to-have features. And the problem with this is you end up building a container and shoehorning features into that container. And it doesn't necessarily take care of all of your customers. Everybody has a pet feature that they want. And everybody is just kind of like lackluster about the eventual product that this produces. So it's important to remember that your goal is to define a solution and not a collection of features. The very best applications on the iPhone are those that solve a problem for a customer. And one of the best ways to make sure that you accurately define a solution instead of just creating a container is by crafting an application definition statement. An application definition statement is comprised of three distinct parts. The first part is your differentiator. This is what's going to set your application apart from all your other customers. You, whether it's you know, easy to use, uh, visually robust, whatever. This is what you're going to use to make your mark. It's what you do special with your solution. The second component is your actual solution. What problem are you going to solve for me as the customer? And the final component is your intended audience. And it's really important that you be as precise as possible about who your intended customer is. If your intended customer were a traveling businessman and he spends most of his time inside of the airport, then you want a very monochromatic, you know, very productivity-oriented, scalable, clean application. But if your intended audience was a fireman and his context is a burning building, you're going to use you know, honking buttons that say, locate my teammates, locate me, or whatever, with overly saturated colors. So, Identifying who your intended audience is is supremely important in figuring out what your application is going to look like in the end. So here we have the application definition statement for iPhoto on the desktop. Easy to use digital photo editing, organizing, and sharing for casual and amateur photographers. You can see that easy to use is our differentiator. This is what's going to set iPhoto apart from competitors. It's easy to use. And we have three solutions inside of this ADS. Digital photo editing, organizing, and sharing. And our intended audience are casual and amateur photographers. And as small as this application definition statement is, that long list of features that you just saw were all the features required to implement this application definition statement. And this is the UI necessary to implement those features or those solutions. And as you can imagine, most of these would not map well to the iPhone. Uh, it would be very difficult to make these finger friendly. But more than that, when looking at our customers, looking at our users of iPhoto. Of the three solutions, only one was prime. Only one was core to all of our customers. For instance, organizing, everybody loves that their photo, they want their photos to be organized. But very few people actually take the time to organize their photos. Most people just scroll through a long list, right? That's why we've come up with things like places, faces, and events, to take that organization burden off of the user. An even smaller subset actually takes the time to edit their photos. In the digital age, film is cheap. So people take a lot of photos, and if they find one that they don't like, they just delete it. They don't actually take the time to rotate it, crop it, and adjust all the levels. So sharing was the one solution that everybody does. Everybody shares the photos, whether it be through a slideshow with people that are around them, or emailing or uploading to a mobile me web server. So with that in hand, 
we were able to craft an application definition statement. Easy to use digital photo sharing for casual iPhone users. Just circling back on the intended audience, many developers punt on the intended audience. They say iPhone users in their application definition statement. It's really important that you be as precise as possible. The reason for this, if we change the end to professional photographers, we'd end up with aperture for the iPhone, a completely different application, just by changing our intended audience. And to take it further, if we use medical imaging, we'd end up with MEMS or some other kind of imaging application on the iPhone, even though it's easy to use and it's digital photo sharing, right? So it's supremely important that you figure out all three components. Once you have figured out your application definition statement, the very next step is to begin to actively feature out, filter out features. And we have a nice little mantra for you guys that you may want to write down. You want to pick the few features most frequently used by the majority of your users that are most appropriate for the mobile context. This is a great way to see if a feature can hold its own. Basically, you're using your application definition statement as like a filter, an ultimate checksum for your entire application. And here we are back at our original list of features for iPhoto. And our new application definition statement is at the top. And once we apply it, you can see only a small subset will actually make it into photos on iPhone. And everybody knows how photos on iPhone works. It's super straightforward. You start out with a list of uh, albums. You choose an album and then you browse visually on a grid. You see you know, which, which photo might I be interested in, and once you tap one of these photos, you inspect that photo in full screen. And the toolbar at the bottom only houses actions that pertain to sharing, the solution that we're trying to provide. You can do a slideshow, you can skip through the, the photos, you can upload to a mobile meet gallery, and you can email the photos. And as simple as photos is, it's one of the most valuable applications on the iPhone. So when you're doing this to your own application and you end up with a real small list of features that you're going to implement, understand that just because your application is simple doesn't mean it won't be very valuable to your customers. So that's product definition. Really, really important. Take the time to craft an application definition statement. Uh, I would challenge you that if you look at the, the most successful applications that are on the store, over 70% took the time to write an application definition statement. They'll tell you if you ask them. So now let's talk about design and prototype. First, we're going to start out with understanding the basics. Here we have a great quote from T.S. Eliot. You must understand the rules before you can break them. And how many of you knew that the next slide would be the human interface guidelines? There was a meme for a while that the HIG is dead. The HIG is not dead. In fact, it's very much alive, and it matters more today than ever, especially with the iPhone. The human interface guidelines contain a wealth of knowledge that has, have been contributed to by our engineers and our designers. They've taken a lot of time to solve various edge cases for you and implement standardized controls that our customers are used to. So if you treat the human interface guidelines as a quick reference guide, you'll miss a lot of nuance, a lot of uh, understanding of why things are the way they are. So our recommendation for you is that you read through the human interface guidelines cover to cover. Read linearly. Don't use it as a quick reference guide. You, you will gain invaluable insight into why something is the way it is. But as you know, a book is a book. And there are many things that uh, those who read the human interface guidelines don't quite understand or they implement incorrectly. And so I'm going to touch on what we consider to be the basics of iPhone user interface design right now so that there's no confusion, so you guys can deliver stellar experiences. The basics loosely consist of multi-touch input, navigation, lists, toolbars, tab bars, and general aesthetics. So let's talk about multi-touch input first. As you know, we've worked really hard to make the standard keyboard that comes with the iPhone as polished as it can be, as approachable and intuitive as it can be for a multi-touch keyboard. But one of the best things about a multi-touch keyboard is that you can draw any custom controls that you need for your application on the screen at any time. So finally, we're away from this age of WASD means up, down, left, right, and hitting the five key on a numpad equals 
select, right? Now, if you need a control that is tools, then you draw a tools control.